On this episode of Elite Access, we had a chance to talk with top-ranked cliff diver Stephen Labou. With a win and a couple of podium finishes, Stephen took third overall in the 2014 Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series. It was a really fun interview. He tells us what it's like to jump off a 90-foot cliff. He takes us through his visualization routine before he dives, and he even talks about the importance of fear in your sport. That's right, the importance of fear in your sport. All right, Stephen Labou, welcome to Elite Access. We are so excited and honored to have you here with us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to get right to it. You were a one and three meter diver in college in the U.S. and you did 10 meter, which you even said was nerve wracking. So how on earth did you make the transition to 27 meter cliff diving at what speeds of like 60 miles an hour? How does that happen? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And when I look back on the the career that I had growing up, um, I couldn't even imagine myself where I am right now. Um, and and just you know, I dove one meter and three meter, and I learned platform whenever we would go to a pool that had platforms because we didn't have them growing up. Oh, wow. And I think that's part of the reason I was so scared of platform. You know, being up on ten meter was not a comfortable place for me. Um, I don't think it's a comfortable place for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, it's a special group of people. That's for sure. Um, I would just say like through university, the couple years at Purdue definitely smoothed that out. Having consistent practice was really nice. Um, and I guess the transition just came because I, I absolutely love the sport of diving and I was just looking for that next challenge, um, a little bit down the road. So, I mean, cliff diving just sort of seemed to be the right fit. So how did you find cliff diving? Like, how did you get into it? It's kind of a long story. I'll, I'll try to keep it short. The, the thing is, um, a lot of us are, you grow up in the sport of diving and, and you're told from a very early age that there's no money in that sport. You, you, it's kind of understood to a lot of people that, okay, you know, I can get a scholarship up through university if I'm really good or, you know, maybe represent my country at the Olympics or international meets, things like that. But from a very young age, it's almost understood that it's not a money sport. It's not baseball. It's not basketball. It's not football. Mm -hmm. um, so when I found out that there, there was a way to, to dive for you know money as a job, I was all for it because of my just like ultimate passion for the sport of diving. Um, so so they have these entertainment shows, they're they're stunt shows or dive shows in theme parks where you know some people might have seen it in a theme park. They have a, a tank set up that's maybe twelve feet deep, and they set up a ladder that goes up about twenty two meters or so, and, and they they do a little dive show. And that was my first experience with all of this, and um and, and it was very it was very freeing to me that, you know, we've been competing for so long with rigid fundamentals and you're constantly being judged from such a young age that now I could continue to do what I love without the harsh judgment or anything like that. And you can almost put your own spin on creativity and how can I do new dives my way and throw a little bit of style in there. And, and that really brought me back to, you know, everything that I love about diving. And it was so you know, more the performance stuff. side. Is that kind of what Absolutely. you're saying? Yeah, the, the performance of it, um, the art of it, the the sort of freestyle aspect to it was really, really good for me. And it brought me back to my love for diving and into the world of high diving. That is so awesome. So I imagine, though, I mean, you talked about how 10 meter was nerve wracking when you first started it, but then you got more comfortable probably at these shows, I'm guessing. But still, I, I, at 27 meters, fear has got to be a factor in this sport. Uh, I mean, and not not even the height alone, but you've got conditions, right? Like there's wind, there's probably sun, there's no sun, there's rough seas sometimes. How do you even begin to deal with that fear or prep yourself? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the biggest thing with fear is just that you, you constantly have to respect it always. And it, it's always going to be there and you have to understand that. Um, the biggest thing, and, and it's sort of the same in competitive diving as well, is you just have to keep that fear um, in an acceptable range. You know what I mean? If If it's too high then you're probably frustrated, you're not thinking clearly, you're just too scared to think about what you need to do to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, if your fear is too low, then maybe you're not respecting where you're at and you could get hurt that way as well. So it, it's definitely one of those things where you just have to be in the right frame of mind and know that you have done all the preparation you had to do to be in that spot. The environmental conditions are a whole separate factor. That It's one of those things where that's what we battle. You know, It's not just another 27-meter platform. Now you're going, okay, we have one and two meter swells, we've got freezing cold rain and wind or just high winds and things like that. And it, it's definitely something where you just have to sit back and sort of respect your fear a little bit and just know that you've done what you had to do to be there. Wow. Wise, wise words. 
So, okay, I read a little bit about Thailand's, is it the Fifi Islands? About, Fifi, yeah. The yeah, Fifi about Island. the um, climb you had to get just to get to the platform. Please describe that to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the challenges with cliff diving is actually the climbs to a lot of these places can be a little bit more difficult than the jump itself. Um, I mean, we're trained for, for 27 meters. It's like if, if you ask a 10 meter diver, 10 meter national diver to do, you know, a front one and a half on 10 meter, it's no problem at all. But if they had to, you know, climb straight up a wall with a harness on, you know, to 14 meter and then rappel down to 10 meter, it's a whole separate situation. So yeah, the, the climb in Thailand was a little crazy. We had to climb up these bamboo ladders that were just sort of bolted to the, the side of the cliff and we had harnesses on. We ended up climbing way past 27 meters. We had to sort of um, like shimmy across a little bamboo pole where there's nothing under you but but water and rocks. And then, you know, once you're in a spot, you have to put on a harness and rappel down to a platform that's, you know, the size of your laptop and just stand on that. And, and that's your takeoff position. So it's it's definitely interesting, some of the climbs. Wow. Okay. So, and you do all that for one jump. Right. It can be one jump. It's, so, most of the time it's you know, four to five in one spot. But Thailand was, you know, so amazing that we had so many different locations. We tried a couple different spots. Wow. That is crazy. So, okay. How many dives do you do in a competition? So we do four dives in a competition, two voluntaries and two optionals. The women from 20 meters will do three dives, one voluntary and two optionals. Okay. And so how many practice dives do you usually do for that? What can your body handle, I guess? We're we're still sort of figuring out what the the limits of our bodies are um, in this sport because because it's been so long where we haven't had anywhere to train. You know, the only time you get up on a twenty seven meter is when one is set up for you, mm -hmm. and so with that, we're still learning how much we can really take. I, I think if I look back at this past year on tour, um, probably I averaged about, including the competition, I averaged maybe twelve dives per per stop which is wow. remarkably low but um it, it's one of those things where you have to listen to your body and you have to understand what you you know can and can't do at, at the moment so most people say okay sports can be 90 percent mental you know and and just 10 percent physical and i think your sport of cliff diving kind of epitomizes that i mean this has to be a completely mental sport how do you prep for that? What kind of visualization do you use? What kind of mental tools have you found that works best for you in these okay. environments? Good. I'm, I'm glad you touched on it too, because this is one of my big, my big talking points when I'm talking about cliff diving. Um, and, and a lot of people in a lot of sports try to put a percentage breakdown on physical and mental. And my take on, on this sport specifically is that it's 100% mental. Oh. And knowing that you've done the physical preparations is part of that percentage. So while it, it may be physical, if you haven't done it, you're not 100% mentally. And if you're not 100% mentally there, then there's really no point. So, is that so like knowing kind of confidence, you mean? Exactly, okay. exactly. Knowing that I've put my time in in the gym five days a week, that I've been in the pool diving, you know, harder than ever, all of that goes into the the confidence level, and you go, okay, I'm 100% ready for this. So I will say, you know, it is definitely 100% mental, and you just have to keep up with you know, your, your workouts. Well, so what does that look like? Because you say you put in all your time at the pool, but that's probably doing lead ups off of a, a 10 meter, like, like preparatory dives off of a 10 meter. So, you, but you're not actually doing the 27 meter dive. So how do you visualize that? Like, how do you mentally prepare? I know it's a hundred percent mental, but how do you actually go through those motions to get mm -hmm. ready for the competition? It, um, it's a, it's a cumulative process. So in the morning or at night, I'll lay down um, just close my eyes and do a lot of visualization. Um, and it's everything, every single thing you can think of, what it looks like on top of a 27 meter, the atmosphere, the loud music, maybe it's cold and rainy or windy. Um, what does it smell like? Everything that you can think of. And um, I start to picture the dives, um, both you know from my point of view and also outside looking in third person, like trying to watch myself dive. And um, what you'll find will happen is a very normal response is your heart speeds up, your hands get sweaty, um, and, and it's totally normal. But what I like to do is once I'm at that point, that's when you start to focus on something and slow yourself down. Because it, if there's one thing that I've learned throughout it, like all of this, it's that relaxation is an exercise. You can't put yourself in a stressful situation and expect to just relax if you haven't practiced that. So... Yeah, so I'm thinking about every single thing I can, trying to make myself nervous, and then practicing 
calming down. And I found that to be uh, really, really helpful. And, and you find that you can enjoy the moment a little bit more and, and where you are. And that's a very peaceful feeling on top of the platform if you can enjoy it. That is very cool. Love it. So, okay. there And there's crowds there, too, that are like, I've heard upward of 70,000 people. I mean, is that intimidating or encouraging? It's exciting. And it's something that I personally never thought I would ever be a part of. Um, we had... 75,000 people in France, we had 52,000 in Spain, wow. um, which is the equivalent of a, a football match. And it really is, it's all inspiring to stand on top of the platform and to see that really kind of humbles you a little bit. And you, It's so amazing to be a part of the sport that we love um, with such a great group of guys. It's definitely inspiring. Are you guys pretty tight? Because you, you all kind of travel to the same events, right? Yeah, I would say that's that's also one of my favorite things about the sport is that I don't think you'll find another sport where there's such camaraderie amongst the competitors. Like we are a very, very, very tight knit group. And you know that when you travel somewhere, you're going to be with 10 or 15 of your absolute best friends. And that's a comforting feeling as well, especially if you're going somewhere you haven't been before. Maybe it's a little scary, um, but we're all, you know, we're all in the same struggle. We all have the same goals, but at the same time, we're all super supportive of each other and I think that's something that is lacking in some of the you know professional sports today mm -hmm. that is really neat well so how do you train in the off season because I know you guys compete from May to October right kind of about one competition a month is that less yeah more or less it can go up to two it's getting busier as the sport grows we're getting more competition so it's definitely getting tougher and tougher to find the downtime but um essentially off season is three or three to five months right now. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's five days in the gym. And I mean, I work in the gym as a personal trainer and I also work at the pool as a coach in my off time. So uh, by no means is the sport lucrative enough yet to where I could do just that. But um, I'm fortunate also that, you know, I work in a gym where I need to work out and I work at the pool where I need to work out. So it, How it, convenient. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very convenient. Um, and then I'll, I just try to get in the pool as much as possible right now. I'm, I'm, I'll stay low and I'll just do lead ups on maybe three meter platform, uh, 10 meter lineups for me now is just a brainy. So just front flip half twist is, you know, 10 to 20 every time. It's no just, problem. yeah, whatever you can do. It's, it's amazing. But, um, well, so how do you stay motivated though? Like, how do you, you know what I mean? There's, it's such a long season of not competing or not doing your 27 meter dives. How do you stay excited and pumped and motivated and like jazzed for that goal that's coming up? it's tough. It's hard to have such a long off season, especially because even after a month of not being up that high, you're scared all over again from the very first time. So, so now you have the nerves coming back into play and, and maybe you're trying to learn a new dive, which is never easy. You know what I mean? So all this together, you really have to keep a grip on, on what you're doing because it can, it can be overwhelming very quickly. Um, so for me, it's not great, but I'm, I was fortunate enough that I had a pretty bad competition for my last competition of the year, which for me is always super motivating, kind of light a fire under my butt and, and get moving. So um, that's big for me. I, I have a lot of things that I would like to accomplish. And so for me, just, I, you know, pretty intrinsically motivate, motivated. Like I, I love the sport of diving. I want to keep progressing, you know, with what we're doing and I want to see how far it'll go and, and, it excites me to try to push the limits of the human body. And, and so, you know, for those reasons, I just try to keep pushing it. Well, speaking of pushing the limits, uh, you debuted a new dive last year. You call it the Quint half, a five mm -hmm. somersaults spike with a half twist. That's right. So how do you go about learning a brand new dive of 27 meters that really nobody else is doing? And what is the risk reward? Because that's a pretty risky move to play. And is it going to pay off? Is it not? How do you, evaluate that and decide if it's worth it yeah, well it's a couple things let's let's go back to learning a new dive because that can be you know there sometimes you're learning a dive that other guys have done and so you get all their feedback and you watch them and you learn it and you you know you develop this plan um and you follow through in my case with the quint half no one had ever tried it pike a couple guys had done it tuck and the last person that tried to tuck got really 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 injured um so that that was tough. I think that would scare me off right off the bat from trying that dive. Yeah, I was actually at the competition and I saw it happen and it was just definitely, you, you take a step back and you sort of reevaluate what you're doing. And, and that's the thing is you have to understand that it is a sport and there are risks associated with it. Um, but yeah, as far as learning that new dive, I just kind of, you know, the, the rule of thumb is if your lead up is good on 10 meter, it's the, the same speed on 27 meters. So 
For example, if I'm doing um, back triple, triple, three somersaults and three twists, mm -hmm. the lead up on 10 meter is back double with two and a half twists. Okay. So you would do your two and a half twists and pike over and then come out and land blind on your feet. Now, if you can do that, all you, and easier said than done, but <laughs> it's the same exact speed on 27 meter. So if you can just put yourself on 10 meter and start that lead up, the rest just sort of falls into place and it, it kind of goes on autopilot. Wow. <laughs> what, what's so, it like? I mean, the adrenaline of doing that new dive for the first time and such a risky dive, pushing the limits of degree of difficulty and everything. It's exciting. It's, it's one of those things where, yeah, you know, uh, may or may not have been the first person to do it. I don't, I don't know for sure. But um, as far as risk reward goes, it, it's, you, you have to watch the sport and, and where do you want to be in the sport? You know what I mean? Like my goal obviously is, is always to win. I love those guys. I love competing, but that's the goal when I'm there. So you have to look at the top level guys and what they're doing and say, okay, well, if I do these lower DD dives, but I do them for nines and tens, is that going to be enough to get past these guys that are doing higher DD dives where sometimes they're nines and tens, but sometimes they miss. And mm -hmm. for me, the biggest thing was just like, go, just go try to get the big DD, obviously work on form and things like that. But um, I'll take the risk over the reward a little bit more. <laughs> and then, uh, I think you touched on it before too, but just the feeling after a dive, like pure elation, it's, it's just, it's amazing. And, and it's not that I go seeking adrenaline. That's not the goal. Um, the goal is to just keep diving and the adrenaline is a, a side effect that you just, you can't fight, but it's, it's nice. That's cool. So I saw on the stops in this season, you had, I think, in the fourth stop in Norway, you kind of had a 10th place finish. But the very next stop in Portugal, I think it was, you won. Mm -hmm. How did you make such a big comeback just from one competition to the next? I would say the, um, I, I almost expect myself to, to be at a higher level than a 10th place finish. So that was really, really tough for me. And it wasn't, it wasn't like I dove my best and then, you know, did poorly. Like, I had a bad competition. And... Mm -hmm being around diving so long, you know that that just happens, whether it was, you know, it was in Norway, so they had 16, 17 hours of daylight, so I wasn't sleeping very well, and you can make all the excuses you want, but I just, I didn't dive well, and, and that's what it comes down to, and so I took those couple weeks, and I really just took a step back and, and tried to relax a little bit, and Portugal was especially tough with the conditions, because we had three different jump spots, two were directly from the cliff, and, and the waters there are, are really brutal. We had you know, one to two meter swells, which can, you know, you can practice a thousand hours, but if a swell goes out a meter, there's nothing you can do about it. It, it goes out and you're... that makes you're, it 28 meters, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Or um, we've had a couple tough injuries in Portugal as well because of the swells, because someone will think they have the full 27 meters, but a wave will come up and take away two meters. And if it hits you in the chin just right, we've had a couple guys be knocked out, um, just cold. They had to be backboarded and um, taken away. So it is very, very dangerous. And, and you just have to, like I said, trust that you've, you've put in the preparation to be there. What kind of injuries have you had? I've been pretty fortunate, actually. Um, a lot of nagging injuries, and, and we're starting to find that more and more, a lot of chronic lower back pain. Um, you know, I'm not on my shoulders and wrists anymore, but I've traded my shoulders and wrists for my knees and my ankles. Um, so it, it's really about making sure everything lower body is, is really strong. Groin pulls are pretty common, adductor strains, hip flexors, things like that. Um, and then the worst injury I've had was my very first competition actually in 2011. And I was learning quad half, so which is four somersaults before I even dreamed of Quint. Um, and I don't think I respected how high we were. And that was where I probably should have been a little more scared than I was because I I took off like I knew what I was doing and I finished the dive completely and still had maybe 10 or 11 meters to fall. And so I, I ended up fracturing my tailbone the day before competition in 2011. Uh, wow. Wow. So that was actually the, the qualifying competition to even qualify for the tour. So I fractured my tailbone the day before. I ended up diving in the competition and qualifying the next day for the 2011 World Series. So it was definitely... Yeah. scary but it's nice to overcome those fears and and yeah it's exciting that that is crazy cool well is there anything else i haven't hit on that you would love to share with the group um i would just say like to anybody that's even interested in in what we're doing um stick with what you're doing now keep diving um if it's something you love to do just leave it all out there because the, the worst feeling is at the end of the day 
asking yourself if I could have done more. And if the answer is yes, then it's not a good feeling to have. And I've been there. So just leave it all in the pool and, and love what you do. That is fantastic. Thank you, Stephen, so much for being with us. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Elite Access. And don't forget, you can gain an even greater advantage by answering the questions that go along with this episode and checking out all the extra resources.